Stateless women in these villages avoid going to the hospital at all costs. Sini dia beranak saya itu cici itu darah itu kan saya cuci. Ambulans datang sini tiga minit saja dah dah sudah itu budak. Itu ibu macam mau pingsan kan? Tapi kami bawa dan mau dia menangis dia, dia mau dibawa ke hospital. Kalau di hospital ini macam macam jadi jadi lah. Budak yang bunuh diri itu tinggal di sini lah takut pembayaran tinggi. Dia ingat itu dia tidak dikasih keluar. Kalau kau balik nanti kami ambilkan polis kau. Terpaksa dia bunuh diri. Sebelum aku balik kena ada anakku, jangan aku bising-bising di hospital. Sebab aku itu batari yang mana sejak ada anakku di situ kau bilang bersama aku. Nah dikasih mana? How many babies have been taken? We know nothing. This is Lahadatu Sabah. Village midwife Gaghajar is attending to her fifth birth this month. Midwife itu saya punya skors, tapi tidak sampai lah. Tapi saya ada training sedikit lah. Oleh kerana bilang itu keturunan saya nombor lima sudah, saya minta ajar sama orang yang bidan yang profesional lah. Tiga, tiga kilo. Kalau kita dipilih. Bersalin di rumah dan di hospital memanglah orang pilih itu lebih selamat kita di hospital sebab semua lengkap ada di hospital ada mahal sedikit susah orang mau bersalin lah saya ini sebenarnya menolong sejak seseorang yang betul betul perlukan pertolongan saya supaya orang tidak susah kewangan kan. The Bajau Laut community that live here are a traditionally nomadic seafaring tribe. They have moved with ocean currents between these islands since the 15th century, long before the formation of Malaysia. Today, the national borders of Malaysia and the Philippines cut through this area. Most Bajau Laut do not have citizenship in either country. Estimates suggest that one in three people living in Sabah are undocumented. A recent study showed that the denial of citizenship to around 300,000 individuals born in Malaysia or to Malaysian parents leads to an estimated annual loss of 6 billion ringgit. This is because they have no access to education or work. To access healthcare, they must pay the same rates as foreigners, which is close to impossible. Even in hospital, they face the possibility of arrest. There's a very interesting way in which I think the community sort of classifies illnesses. It's between being able to handle and not being able to handle. A medical officer is the equivalent to a police officer in the sense that they are a point of authority. They ask questions, they feel informed, they can make an informed decision about your person when you are in their presence. So I can understand the hesitancy of going. It's only when they cross the threshold of not being able to handle the pain, complications that members of the community cannot sort of find remedies for, then it has to be a question of going to the hospital. Itulah aku melahirkan enam bulan itu. Tapi saya banyak darah di rumah ini dah kebawa tu di hospital. This woman agreed to share her story with us, but was afraid to reveal her identity in case any action is taken against her. She and her premature baby were given emergency life-saving treatment at Lahad Datu Hospital. When she had recovered, she was ready to go home. Dia bilang ada perempuan doktor itu, ini dah lagi pergi rumah kau lagi kau dulu. Kasih sihat beramu nanti kau pergi hospital. Jumpa nak pun. She did as she was told and went home while her baby continued treatment in the hospital's neonatal intensive care unit. When she did return to the hospital, she was shocked. She 
Terus aku balik ke dadan aku, jangan aku bising-bising di spital. Nah, aku tahu apa lalu ni aku. Nah, terus balik aku. I've heard enough from women on the ground through the work that I do that they've experienced very similar situations. So, it's not a shock. Um, and that in itself should be shocking. Malaysia Kini journalist Espinota has recorded three cases of women losing or almost losing their babies at the hospital. The first, a woman named Aima. She was accused of uh, baby dumping. She was accused of uh, abandoning her child at the hospital. And the welfare officer also said that he couldn't find her at her village. Within a week, she had lost custody of her child. Every day she was there wanting to see her child and she was denied access to the child. As far as our research goes, there are other women who nearly lost custody of the child. Two other women from the same village, Sarlina and Valentia. Both of these women had infants that were admitted to the NICU. Despite regular visits to the hospital, both mothers found out that the Department of Social Welfare Malaysia, or JKM, had decided that the children were abandoned and were introducing adoptive parents within weeks of the birth. The normal process would be that even if the child is abandoned, then the child would be under the care of the welfare department or JKM. And there would be a lengthy process to get the baby to be adopted because there's a long list of applicants who want to adopt. If you manage to get your application to be approved, um, subject to assessment by the welfare department. So it would take some time. I think it ranging from months to years. Even if they go to court, if they say that the baby is abandoned, for example, they have to advertise in the newspaper to look for the mother of this child. So you cannot just say that, okay, this baby is abandoned without, you know, making an effort to find the mother. A medical officer familiar with Laha Datu Hospital agreed to speak to us anonymously to avoid possible repercussions. Certain actors in the hospital are taking it upon themselves to declare that these babies that are kept in the ward are actually abandoned babies, whereas this is not the case. And I think the attempts to find the parents were not carried out appropriately, uh, and hence they were just labeled as abandoned. So when the parents came back to look at their child, they were told that the child has already been taken custody of. Over multiple years, official data from JKM shows zero record of adoptions in Sabah. I know lawyers who do adoption almost every year. So basically to have zero um, adoption cases, it's, it's a bit strange. Rafika also added that there are many informal adoptions happening in Sabah. Informal adoption is an adoption. Uh, without any court involvement. So it means that you don't go through the legal process. There is a reported case, which was reported by JPN, that there is a, a syndicate falsifying the information of over 200 births uh, since 2009. So I believe it is quite common for adoption not going through the formal legal process. For Sarlina and Felendaya, they were able to take their babies home after another villager contacted JKM's child protection officer threatening to file counterclaims. In Aima's case, after she was told to leave the hospital, her baby was placed with foster parents. She was only informed of this when Malaysia Kini published their article two years later. She has been told not to speak to the media again. JKM failed to provide comment before the publishing deadline. Malaysia Kini quoted the child protection officer who acted in all three of these cases as saying he generally viewed the stateless community to be unfit parents because they live in poverty and deplorable conditions, which he said is unsuitable for a child. I can see how narratives like that can grow. There are many families who want babies. So, you know, this could solve it because you don't have the capacity to care for the child and we might be able to do a better job. The problem is, is when it's not consensual, when it is assumed that a parent should want to give this child up to the authorities for a better future. Consent is especially difficult to give if it was not asked. These are families and, you know, people's lives that you're uh, dealing with and you have no transparency or accountability towards the people. When you say that you're going to take a child away from the mother, even if you've given it to her in a form, you need to explain it to her. Why she is losing custody of her child. I think you owe it to that woman, to the mother, 
it needs to be absolutely transparent. Every single step that you take, when do they call the social welfare? What does the social welfare officer look at? How many babies have been taken? Nothing. We know nothing. Vinota was drawn to investigate what was happening in Sabah after hearing another tragic story. Another underage uh, Bajalaut girl uh, from the neighboring village, Kampung Ai. I wanted to know why she committed suicide. You know, why is the situation for the stateless people so, so bad until a, a young girl uh, chooses to commit suicide with her child? <laughs> Dia punya mama mau keluar dari hospital pasal mungkin terlalu lama lah di hospital jadi pihak hospital tidak kasih keluar sampai diugut dikasih takut ditangkap diambilkan polis saya tanya di mana itu perempuan tinggal jadi dong ada beritahu saya di sini di sebelah surau kemudian saya pergi keluarganya langsung tidak ada sudah si itu tinggal. Pihak polis ambil berdas siasat lah. Sampai dia, dia punya laki pun mungkin kena panggil lah. Ketakutan sampai dia pergi lari lah. She was also told that she would lose custody of her child. She was constantly harassed. Uh, her, her then village head had said that she was uh, harassed for money and it was quite common for the hospital to do that. We at the East Coast of Saba have the highest unpaid bills because we have a high population of undocumented people. So that is why that pressure comes from on top as well to try and reduce this unpaid bill where the patients are not allowed to discharge until they can pay. We do have fever stuck in the war. It's not an uncommon uh, occurrence. The Saba State Health Department did not respond to multiple requests for comment. The SAPD are very well aware how critical primary health care is for pregnant mothers and for children. So if you don't receive routine antenatal care uh, and you can't deliver in a safe environment, then there's significant adverse maternal child outcomes for these people. So most of the stateless migrant uh, refugee women are in this situation. When we looked at migrant communities, their mortality rates are 15 to 20 times that of the national average. Indigenous uh, mortality rates are also significantly higher, almost 10 to 11 times that of the national average. Saya keluar di rumah saya, saya nampak ada orang mau beranak. Di sini dia beranak. Ini dia punya tempat. Di sini dia beranak, saya itu cuci, itu darah itu kan saya cuci. Dia baring, dia punya kepala sini. Sini dia punya anak. Saya ambil pergi luar, kita boleh. Tiga minit saja ambulans datang terus. Tiga minit saja, dah dah sudah itu budak. Itu masuk kan itu mulai dia tidak mau sudah naik tidak mau habis itu budak kan sudah meninggal lah budak mungkin dia takut kan betul lah kalau di hospital ini macam-macam jadi jadilah orang pun takut itu ibu macam mau pingsan kan dia secara betul suami dia ada di kesempatan tidak mau turun habis takut sama polis itu bibi itu lelaki kami bungkus pakai sarung Itu gendung baru bawa pergi sampan. The woman we spoke to eventually found out that her baby had been adopted by another family. Pas aku balik tiga hari aku belum makan menangis saja. Pagi malam begitu saja. Terus bilang laki ku kalau aku begini saja sampai kau tambah sakit. Tapi kalau aku bayangkan kan perasaan ku menderita waktu dulu, apa boleh buat saya minta saja doa apa tuan? A decision to take the child is made by a person in that civil service structure that does have the authority to do that. But the fact an individual thought that they could find loopholes to sort of justify making those decisions is also very telling of a problematic system. I don't take the position of demonizing people, although we must call out actions that are completely wrong. You have to demonize systems. And if there is a system that allows for this to happen, it cannot continue to exist because there will be more children and the person with the most to lose is a stateless mother. And so systems have to be designed to put her and her child first. 
the welfare department is a very critical department and it's vital to point out that they're chronically short-staffed. Sadly, the majority of the staff that we have, they're not trained social workers. So that means they're not fully aware of the obligations under the Child Act. Our Child Act is, is a wonderful act. In its preamble, it states this, every child is entitled to protection. Every child is entitled to assistance in all circumstances. When you provide primary immunization to all children in Malaysia, you actually create a herd immunity and reduce the risk to uh, Malaysians, not just to those non-Malaysians. We're not talking about millions of children here. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of children, which is something that we could absorb into the system without too much difficulty. And I hope that this will be the guiding light for us to move forward in this country.